point about disconnections. I was wondering, and this is partly because we are starting some research now looking at um, what people do across di different image uh, platforms, and particularly we want to know practices around untagging or deleting pictures or pressure to post. So sort of some of the more negative aspects or the, the the things, the practices that maybe you hear less about or you make assumptions about. Mm. And so one of the things that I was wondering as you immediately as you said, you know, kind of disconnect, and maybe this is, is not something that's come up, but but I was wondering about this in relation to um, an anecdote somebody recently told me, is parents uploading videos on YouTube of their children and then children deciding at a later point that they would like videos to be taken down or that there is a negotiation with the parents or other people who might um, upload them in a way or capture them in a way that, that hasn't been negotiated or that they feel is, is inappropriate. And so the kind of the disconnect around, I don't want you to share my image or I don't want you to share video footage of me uh, for these and these reasons. And I thought your, your example, I think of um, Abby and, and Salma, mm. who had a show that was then revealed, and the, the exposure through mm. a particular kind of visibility, even though they are visible, but that kind of different context within that, vis within that visibility than in the classroom, and then mm. them stopping the practice. So I'm, mm. I'm interested in in the practices maybe that they talked about, or other people mm. filmed that they, they were unhappy about. Yeah, I think, no, great question, Frida, thank you. Um, yes, I think. What's, what kind of lies behind so many of these different practices of engagement um, is a, a sort of effort to find a space of agency where uh, the young people feel they can pursue their interest and they pursue you know, such a diversity of interests, sometimes in YouTube or online, and sometimes not at all. Uh, but it's that sense of agency and um, having control has become such a negative word, but they want to have control over it, yes. And so a lot of their talk, and I would say it's about the way they talk about their social lives offline as well as online, is fraught with the potential for embarrassment and uh, things being embarrassing they talked about a lot. Uh, and one of the embarrassing is about um, losing control over that which you want to have control of, which you don't understand exactly, or you can't anticipate the ramifications of in these kind of complex networks that they are all embedded in. Uh, and um, the search for disconnection, you could, we could see in relation to um, their peers, but much less than in relation to the adults, the teachers and the parents. So there was a, there's a kind of, you know, that's why I'm positive about, in a way, about the civility that the classroom generated with its kind of convivial watching of out-of-date mass media. Um, because there was a kind, there's a, they, they talked about each other with a kind of sibling tolerance, even though things could go wrong and they could clash. But parents and teachers building spaces, often with nice educational or shared purposes, that intruded into their lives, that was a kind of a, that was something they really wanted to. Um, it, it comes up much more in the ways in which they talk about social networking and teachers you know, setting up Facebook groups for their kids. Just no, please, no. <laughs> um, and, um, and parents... Uh, parents is an emerging story, I think, because we've become used to the idea of parents as digital immigrants and the kids as digital agents, to use this trite term. And now the parents are doing it too. And, um, yeah, well, as the kids see it, proving remarkably insensitive. Though I have just written a paper about the way in which parents post pictures of their kids because what they want to say is about me as a parent. I mean, th that is also their identity, and they need the kids to show who they are. It's just that the kids don't want the parents to show who the kids are. So there's an asymmetry. Thank you very much.
Um, hi, Seven. Uh, so thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could um, uh, explain a bit more about the music practices for the students that were musicians or were studying music and for the ones that use YouTube for music purposes and uh, whether any of the students that were uh, intentionally wanted to pursue a career in music, if they were very open about it or if it was something that was just mentioned to you but was not publicly um, announced in class and so on. I think music is, is positioned, especially for young adolescents, as the creative form they, they have the potential to um, really do something with. And um, I couldn't say the same about art, which is sort of taught at school, and a few took up, or drama, which there's something about music that seems really to kind of start with their interest because they're, lo they're all immersed in listening to music the entire time. And perhaps because they see so many um, music stars who are making money and are successful. But it, it seems they talk about it like that is the potential route. You know, if anything is going to take them in a creative, self-taught route to success, it will be music. And it's a kind of irony then that music is the probably the thing that, especially the pressurising, concerted cultivation types of parents most try to get their kids to learn. So there's a sort of clash of genres, and you know, the, the official teaching is of the classical music curriculum, and what the kids want to learn themselves is how to play like their favourite band and YouTube offers them the latter route. Mm. And some of them could really kind of compartmentalize you know, the two musics. Um, but it's only, it was really only the kids who wanted to learn the classical route going up through the grades, which seemed to us remarkably like going up through the levels, that would be positively recognized as learning something worth knowing by the teachers and the parents. And the ones who were, you know, Fesse spent hours and hours and hours, you know, and he would practice by himself and then an uh, older brother or his father who also played the guitar would come in and they'd do it together and then he'd be on his own and then he'd go to the YouTube tutorial to learn the next, you know, mm -hmm. how do you play A flat minor or whatever it is, um, or how do, you, how do you do that particular um, uh, part of the song. And it was a very kind of dedicated self-taught process that and yet, to his teachers, he was a chaotic boy who was always late and never seemed to pay attention to anything. And I was just kind of fascinated by, you know, how he could be someone so different and self-motivated. And there was the digital world exactly, providing him with the just-in-time snippets of information he wanted, mm -hmm. not the 45 minutes monologue that told him what someone thought he should yeah. So, I, I suspect there are many kids like that. Thanks very much, Sonia. I, I, um, I've been engaged in the last three years or so in, with a project uh, on um, uh, the way in which screen education, uh, how screens are used in, 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 in classrooms. It's different from yours. Is very much focused on um, on the kids and their uses, but. Just think for a minute about the out-of-date uh, mass media that comes through that rather strange screen. Are you saying that that screen uh, is a is an actually an active screen? Yeah. That, right. So it's yeah. like a large wide screen. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, one of the one of the really strong uh, findings in the work that we've been doing is that um, YouTube is the go-to place yeah. for almost all teachers under almost all circumstances these days. And, and while your study is not teacher-centric, I wondered whether you might want to comment a little on, it's not only, um, you know, long-form chariots yeah. of fire, you know, like yeah. now we're going to watch 90 minutes of chariots of fire. That one of the big findings that we had was that the ability, YouTube delivers chunked yeah. edu educative yeah. content um, in, in, in very, um, you know, bite-sized yeah. chunks 
with a with a, uh, a you know to flavour some an appealing kind of format for kids because of the the general familiarity they have with you know, that you can go to YouTube for anything kind of thing. So would you say a little bit or make want to make a comment about teaching strategies or pedagogic strategies in that classroom? Um, hopefully that doesn't take you away from your primary frame, which is about the kids themselves. Well, um, I mean, actually, in, in the data set, we have lots from the teachers, and we interviewed all the teachers and spent time with them as well, but we didn't kind of put their voices in the book, which we wanted to be mm. the children speaking primarily. So I'm still thinking what to do with, with what I have from mm. the teachers, mm. uh, who are, um, a lot of them kind of rather excited and willing to experiment with different kinds of forms. I mean, YouTube is... Yes, the sort of the go-to um, provision of uh, audiovisual content. Um, there were lots of other experiments. They were trying to set up blogs with kind of you know fun maths puzzles that mm. the kids could do in the evenings if they wanted to, which they do. Um, and uh, very and, and Facebook groups, as I said, you know, they were kind of using. I think they are at the point of experimenting with possibilities. Um, there was a struggle in this school, as I think there is in many schools, about how to resource this and how to kind of train those teachers so that they um, have the, so they have the right kinds of you know, the content they need that fits in the ways that they want, and you know how how is it being communicated and explained to parents and children that some of this could bridge home and school or could be done outside school time. Um, there was um, an interesting, I mean, I, I, I say the window on the world thing with some, with some pain because I, there's that moment in the class when you say, now we're going to watch a film, and even if it's only five minutes, I'm sorry to say that Roots was broken up into ten minute chunks and spread over an interminable number of Friday afternoons, mm -hmm. um, not watched all at once. Um, there is just something about the minute they dim the lights when everyone just goes, yeah. Yeah, and kind of turns off their critical faculties, mm. and you could see the teachers, you know, they're tired and yeah. stressed, so they, then they turn back the curriculum when the lights go up again. Yeah. Um, and that kind of worries me, because YouTube does a lot of stuff in the class. It puts up adverts, they think something's going to come up, and it's blanked out because it's been taken down for some copyright reason, <laughs> and, you know, there's... Or uh, the, the server's gone down again. Yeah. Because, you know, the, so it's frustrating and quite anxiety provoking for them. And then mm -hmm. when it does work, there's a kind of you know sit back, don't mm -hmm. think critically. So I see the desire to experiment, and I see the potential. Mm -hmm. But I could also see ways in which um, the very appeal of audiovisual material, uh, unless used really skillfully, turns off people's critical faculties. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Roots is not a window in the world in the story of slavery. Um, and a lot of the stuff that they used um, was not the kind of naive world. Right. Well, just one quick follow-up. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it, it wasn't um, the case for you, clearly, but um, YouTube has been, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, the lot, have been banned yeah. in many school yeah. jurisdictions, yeah. in many, many places in the world. Um, that's not so much the case now, but certainly earlier on it was for reasons such as the intrusiveness of advertising, yeah. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, just thinking again of like a YouTube-centric approach to some of these things that that um, uh, that the, the the experience you've just given of the anxiety around the um, hybrid and commercial nature of YouTube. I mean, that in in our case, we found that teachers heavily curated their use of YouTube so that they didn't they went in with with pre loaded content or they they knew it, you know they knew how to control for those kinds of anxiety causing moments. Okay, one last question Thank you. My question will be on parents and children's use of YouTube and media. Because you mentioned um, cases when parents discourage children or they don't find this use meaningful. 
um, or they embarrass their children in some ways uh, in media. And I was just wondering, were there any instances where parents actually had a positive influence on children's views of media or YouTube? Were there any collaborations between parents and children? Uh, so were there any instances where they actually worked together to m meaningfully use media, develop some knowledge, develop some skills? <laughs> um, I, I don't say that I got to know everything about those kids' lives, and they um, are you know, just one group of 28 kids, so it's possible. Um, I think um, I, I could see that more for um, things that parents felt they knew more about, like sharing, learning, uh, how to use a camera together. You know, if a parent was kind of into photography, but I didn't see that. Um, maybe a little bit with Giselle, who had her own channel, and her dad, who was quite arty, kind of you know, helped with a few bits of the. But mainly, you know, and this might be about the age group we picked, I and mean, we wanted 13 to 14, because they are kind of on the brink, in a sense, of, and, but they are really wanting to feel their own. Um, they kind of do it by themselves and, they, and do the things that they can do without. Um, parents could help in other ways. They helped with homework. They uh, shared going down after this and all watching telly together or they cooked together. It's not that these were, you know, in any way dysfunctional parents. It's more like there was a kind of tacit agreement that when the kid goes upstairs and opens the laptop or computer or takes their phone off, that's their time. Uh. Um, thank you, Sonia. I don't want this discussion to end, uh, to be honest with you, but I think we are all uh, getting a little bit tired after two days of a full conference. Thank you so much for sharing with us this fascinating. attending the conference and, and sticking for all uh, two days. A special thank you to our keynote for having a fantastic interacting with everyone, listening to everyone's paper. We really appreciate that. Um, I, I won't spend too long. I would just like to thank uh, Professor Jane Arthurs for organizing the conference. It was really her brainchild. Uh, Alessandro and I for supporting uh, uh, Jane. And last but not least, I really want to thank our army of people who made this conference possible, starting with Nicola Skinner, who has been behind the scenes every day, making sure that everything runs smoothly any day. Thank you so much. Tech support, 